All right, so uh, let's begin lecture two, which is on sets and their properties. And uh, I accidentally uh, also covered a little bit about maps in this lecture because I, I forgot my <laughs> I forgot my plan, but I hope you can forgive me. They all kind of go together, though. Um, all this material is material you might find in your introduction to proofs course, let's say. Um, so I won't prove everything, um, but let's just get into it. Mostly this is language, right? Um, a set with no elements is the empty set. So here's notation, squiggle, squiggle, or this looking funny looking symbol here. This notation for the empty set. All right. A set with one element is called a singleton. For example, the set just containing zero, there's one. Um, definition. If a set has n elements, where n is a natural number, then we say that the cardinality of s is n, or the size of s is n, and s is finite. Also, the empty set has size zero, or cardinality zero, and uh, the empty set is finite. And uh, if s is not infinite, excuse me, if s is not finite, then it's infinite. And we say that the cardinality of s is equal to infinity. Okay. So, um, so I should I should make a comment here since we're using Minetti um, for the most or misusing perhaps at times um, this book here, Topology by Marco Minetti Springer. Right. Um, he tends to use the notation for subset like this. Whereas I, by default, use that, all right? So when Minetti would write, when A is not equal to B and A is a subset of B, Minetti would write A subset not equal to B like that, because he uses this to mean that. But um, I will not follow his convention because this writing subset like that is kind of hardwired into my brain. I can't undo it without a lot of effort. And even if I tried, I just make mistakes here and there and lead to confusion. So I'm gonna stick with my, my default there. Okay. Again, that is uh, going against Minetti's notation. So, anyway, not a big deal. If A and B are sets, X is an element of A implies X is an element of B. For each X and A, then we write A is a subset of B, right? And in that context, we also say that B is a superset of A. All right. Um, you may remember that there are a few. Um, I got too many, got too many lectures in the way. Here. All right. Uh, you may recall that we had, you know, um, a few basic operations with sets we like to talk about. Um, union, right? X is an A or X is an B. Intersection, X is an A and X is an B. Um, and set difference, X is an A, X is not in B. And here's a a Venn diagram um, of each of these set constructions, right? The union, the intersection, the set difference. Um, there's also something called symmetric difference, but I, I didn't bother to write it down. That's, that's interesting. You can make like a group operation out of that. If you have the right abstract algebra book, you'll, you'll notice that in the homework problem. Um, anyway, let's see here. Moving on. Get my paper in line here. Uh, my example one is mostly just to introduce notation. Um, so we, I, this is what I default for natural numbers. My natural numbers start at one. Sorry for those of you who like to start at zero. That's just my, that's the way I, I was taught this way and I'm, I'm still doing it. Um, anyway, the integers, of course, are zero plus or minus one plus or minus two plus or minus three and so forth, right? Rational numbers, uh, fractions, right, of, 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 of integers with non-zero denominators. Real numbers are the completion of the rational numbers, which is a, a, a technical and formidable construction, which um, I'm just going to gloss over in this lecture. But there is a way to get from Q to, Q to R um, using analysis. Um, the other way, of course, is like abstract algebra. You can look at, um, you know, the uh, equivalence. You can look at the set of all... Uh, well, anyway, it's kind of the same thing. There's the Dedekind cuts, and then there's the, uh, the adjoining limit points. Either way, it's just... Anyway, so completion of Q gives you R. And um, complex numbers, of course, are A plus IB, such that A and B are real, and I squared is equal to minus 1. 
How do you actually build such a thing? Well, that, that's kind of immaterial to hear, but there are a few different ways. All right. Um, anyway, the larger point here is that uh, with these standard number systems, we typically view them as actually being uh, concrete subsets of one another. Um, and in that sense, n is a sub natural numbers are a subset of integers, they're a subset of rational numbers, they're a subset of real numbers, are a subset of complex numbers. Right? So what that means is that every natural number is a complex number, every integer is a complex number, every rational number is a complex number, every real number is a complex number. However, this is a strict superset. I don't have to put these equalities here, right? There are um, complex numbers which are not real numbers. And, and likewise, each, way, each, each, each time you go down the chain, right, I could, as I say down here in blue, you could just write that in my notation, right? These are actually strict inclusions. Okay, hopefully I'm not telling you anything you didn't already know. Um, definition. So, here we go. For sets x and y, a function or a map. So we use the word map or mapping and function pretty much interchangeably in this in, in this course. Um, I think sometimes people build a little structure in the map. Sometimes people would say a map is a continuous function. Um, Maybe MedEddy does that as we go on. I, I don't remember right off. We'll, we'll find out. But for the moment, just at this current lecture, um, uh, and at least up through lecture four, which I've already written, um, function and map are used interchangeably with mapping. Okay? Anyway, so f is a function from x to y is a single valued assignment <clears throat> of f of x for each x and x. And we also write x maps to f of x or x maps to y to express the action of f. We also can write this, x, y, with an arrow with the f over it like that. Um, x is called the domain, y is called the codomain. And um, if a is a subset of x, if a is a subset of the domain and b is a subset of the codomain, then we can also define the image of f, of a under f, right? Image of a under f as f of a, right? So this is a set of values, f of x such that x is an a. Right, or the inverse image of b under f, and that would be the set of points in the domain whose values are in b. All right. So um, an example of this um, notation, right down here. Um, if I have f of x is x squared plus y squared, well, that defines a function from r two to r, right? And uh, I guess I haven't introduced that properly in these notes, but that's r cross r, right? The Cartesian product of r with itself, but I, you're taking topology, you know this. Um, otherwise, why are you taking topology? I, I, anyway, um, the inverse image of the negative numbers is the empty set, because you can't have x squared plus y squared give you a negative number. The inverse image of zero is just the origin, because the only solution to x squared plus y squared equal to zero is zero, zero. Um, on the other hand, if you have r greater than zero, the inverse image of r squared is a circle of radius r centered at the origin, right? Because f inverse of r squared would be the set of x comma y in r2 such that x squared plus y squared um, is an element of the set just containing r squared, which is, an, is, which is to say that x squared plus y squared equals r squared, right? And, and, and that's a circle. So, um, and this example um, if I was to if I was to draw it, it's it's kind of neat, right? You've got the um, inverse image of zero is just the origin, right? And then you have what do you have? You got you got circles, right? And so like the inverse image of each value of r squared gives you a different circle, right? There's just and if you think about it. If you just keep looking at these circles, those are supposed to be circles, um, they'll fill out the plane, right? Each point in the plane is going to be captured by just one circle. Uh, you know, each point in the plane falls on just one circle of a particular distance from the origin. And then there's the origin, right? And um, the set of circles and the origin, they, they partition the plane into disjoint subsets. So that's not an accident. Uh, let's, let's, let's go on here. All right, so properties of sets. So what can we say about the sets? So I, um, I took the liberty of 
looking outside of MedID, I just wanted to gather together, um, you know, just some basic facts about unions and intersections and everything because I think we could all use a review because um, in the upcoming work, topology is very set theory based, so we need to know these properties to be, um, you know, not, not to spin our wheels and like, if you didn't know what you're doing set theoretic wise in about two weeks or so, you know, you, you could be making yourself a lot of trouble by just not knowing some set theory, right? So let's let's just set the table here, put everything in front of us. So there's the distributive laws. The intersection of a union is the union of the intersections. Likewise, the union of an intersection is the intersection of the unions, right? There's these De Morgan laws, which is the set difference of the union is the intersection of the set differences the set difference of the intersection is the union of the set differences. I feel like I said the same thing up there, but this is the intersection of the set differences. Sorry, my, my memory's not good. Um, when I first saw De Morgan's Law, I saw it in the context of, like, when I was at a community college in an electronics program, we studied, um, you know, um, we had a course in, what was it called? Uh, I think finite math, right? And we studied... Uh, binary arithmetic and such, and there's a correspondence to there. Um, and um, anyway, if you talk about the complement of a set, that, that there has to be like a universe of discourse, right? So the complement of a set is the difference of the universe in the set, and that you can define that by X bar. And if you sort through De Morgan's laws in terms of complements, they're a little bit simpler looking, right? The complement of a union is the intersection of the complements. The complement of an intersection is the um, union of the the complements. And then when you do um, binary arithmetic, mm -hmm. like it corresponds to this, it just, it becomes like, this would be addition, this becomes multiplication, this is multiplication, that becomes addition. It's pretty neat. All right, enough about all that. Um, it doesn't really have much to do with this course, I don't think. Um, so here's here's some basic properties of, of union, intersection. Um, all of these make like uber-friendly um, first, first test in topology questions, right? Like, hey, here, here's a basic set theory thing to prove. You know, that would be a very friendly question. Um, I guess unless you didn't know how to prove it, but these are pretty simple to prove, right? Um, a union B is B union A. Um, union is associative. A is a subset of A union B. Um, a union A is A. A union the empty set is A. A is a subset of B if and only if the union of A with B is B. Um, and likewise, intersections commutative, it's, oops. Well, that that doesn't seem, that does, doesn't seem that interesting, does it? Maybe I should probably make it say something here, huh? There we go. So you can put parentheses wherever you want, pretty much. Um, that's probably not true. Um, but certainly intersections associative. Um, a intersect B is a subset of A, A intersect A is A, A intersect the empty set is the empty set. Um, the empty set's a lot like zero for, you know, arithmetic, you know, like zero times anything is zero. Empty set intersect zero is zero. And union's kind of like addition, right? Empty set union, is like A plus zero is A again, so it's kind of like plus and kind of like multiplies, but kind of, it's not the same as is. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, a little bit more. This is an important one. We find ourselves needing this in careful proofs going forward, all right? So, um, you know, A equals B as sets, if and only if A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. So this is the so-called double containment, if and only if set equality theorem. Actually, I don't know what it's called, but some people call it double containment. Um, I tend to call it the characterization of set equality by subsets, but man, whatever. This is transitivity of subsets, right? A subset of B, B subset of C means A is a subset of C. Um, and so, like, you know, these sorts of set theoretic claims you can prove by picture sometimes. Um, and, uh, you know, depending on how carefully you write your, uh, your proof in terms of you know, English sentences, this may be a more careful proof. <laughs> um, but here's a picture. A intersect, so I'm drawing A is the red circle, right? B union C is 
this is C, this is B, right? So B union C would be anything in the two green circles, right? So when you intersect the red circle with the totality of both of the green circles, you get this blue funny looking shape, right? On the flip side of things, if we look at A intersect B, it's this red lemony thing here, right? Um, and if we look at A intersect C, it's this green lemony looking thing here, right? And then if you union those two together, you get this, which of course is the same as that, right? Up to the limits of my artistry, but uh, there you go. That's proof by picture, which, um, I, I, you know, also, um, <clears throat> sometimes a proof by picture, if you're, if you're not allowed to give a proof by picture, still a proof by picture will guide you to a careful sentence by sentence proof anyway. Um, so I, I find these to be useful organizational tools even when you're not allowed to use them as the ultimate answer. Here is a um, stodgy <laughs> sentence by sentence, um, not clever, just, you know, brute force proof of this claim. A, um, the set difference of A by the union of B and C is equal to the intersection of the set differences of A with B and A with C. So I will prove this by double containment. All right, so I let X be an element of this guy. All right, so what I'm trying to do is show an element of this is an element of that. That will show that the left-hand side is a subset of the right-hand side, right? That's what my goal is. So let X be an element of this. That means X is an A and X is not an element of B union C, right? Now, X not an element of B union C means that X is not an element of B and X is not an element of C, right? Because if X was an element of B or an element of C, it would mean an element of union, by definition of union. All right, so we know X is not an element of B and X is not an element of C. So putting it all together, we have X is an element of A, X is not an element of B, it's not an element of C, right? So this and this give me that X is an element of A, and a, 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 a minus B. And X is an element of A, X is an element of C gives me that X is an element of A minus C. Um, thus, it's in both this and that, by the definition of intersection, we have that x is an element of a minus b intersect a minus c. So I showed an arbitrary point in here is in there, which proves that a minus b union c is a subset of a minus b intersect a minus c. All right, that's half of it. Now we go the other direction. Conversely, suppose I pick a point in here, right? x and a minus b intersect a minus c. Well then, x is an element of a minus b, and x is an element of a minus c, right? That means that x is an element of a, and x is not an element of b, and not an element of c. It follows then that x is not an element of b union c, as we discussed, right? Hence, x is not an element, hence x is an element of a minus b union c, because it's in a, but it's not in here, right? And so, hey, that's what I was trying to show. I was trying to show that x was an element of the left-hand side, given it was in the right-hand side. So we find that a minus b intersect a minus c is a subset of a minus b union c. And in conclusion, by double containment, we get that these sets are equal, which, of course, is one of De Morgan's laws. All right? Um, now, you could also try to prove this by picture. You know, I didn't bother, but it's, it's fun to do. But most professors would, in like certainly in the elementary proofs class, I'd want to see something like this. And even this probably wouldn't quite pass muster with a lot of professors because there's some things I said out loud, right, that I didn't put on the paper, um, which is forbidden with some people. But, um, you know, I, it's a, it's a question, <laughs> question of style, I suppose, um, and the standards and parameters of your course. But anyway, claim. This is transitivity of subset, right? So A is subset of B, B is subset of C, then A is a subset of C. All right. So suppose A is a subset of B and B is a subset of C. All right. Let X be an A. Then as A is a subset of B, we find X is an element of B. But as B is a subset of C and X is in B, we find X is an element of C. Therefore, by definition, a is a subset of C, because I took X in A, and I proved it was in C, right? For arbitrary X, that proves A is a subset of C. Now, you know, some other criticisms of my current writing. 
to be fussy, I should have said at the start of these claims, let A and B and C be sets, right? Um, or let A, yeah, let A and B and C be sets, because, you know, one of the fundamental errors that students make is they do things like set sets are equals to numbers, right? But we should make a distinction between sets and the elements which are in the sets, right? Those are different levels of classification, I suppose. All right, moving on here. So um, sometimes we, and this is probably something you didn't do in your proofs class, probably not, but we can generalize union and intersection to be more than just a finite number of things. We can do it over an index set, right? Um, and so I is a set, it, it doesn't have to be finite, it could be infinite, it doesn't have to be like a set of natural numbers, it could be, I could be like a subset of R3 or something, like you can make indices whatever you want, okay? Um, it's, it's not necessarily the case that you can enumerate them like I do down here, I equals one to infinity, this is a special case. This is the case that the indices are the natural numbers, right? It, it need not be the case, you could have an index which is real, a real index. Now sometimes people would call such an index a parameter or something, um, but anyway, union of a sub i for i in the index set i, what that is is it's x such that there exists a j in i such that x is an element of a j. In other words, x is in the union of these guys if there's just one of these guys which contains x, all right? I mean it doesn't have to be just one, it could be more, but if there, if there exists one that's enough, all right? could be in all of them, okay? Um, intersection x such that x is in aj for all j in the index set, all right? And um, also going forward I sometimes drop the element of, uh, of, sometimes I'll just write union over like script i or union over script i. You'll, you'll see my more lazy notation as we go on here, okay? Anyway, so claim, let's scooch this up a bit. Uh, the basically this is the distributive law generalizes to indexed unions okay so the union of two indexed intersections is the intersection um, over all indices of the unions so so here's half of the proof <laughs> sorry it's horrible um, let x be an element of, of this guy. That means x is an element of that intersection, or x is an element of that intersection. So two cases. If x is an element of this intersection, then x is an element of a i for all a uh, for all i index i, right? Thus x is an element of a i union b j for all i and for all j, which means that x is an element of the intersection of this guy, right? Vice versa, if x is an element of the intersection over j of bj, that means x is an element of bj for all j, thus x is an element of ai union bj for all indices i and j, and so therefore it's in the intersection over all i and j of the unions of ai and bj. Therefore, this is a subset of that. All right, and you can, you can reverse this argument to give the other inclusion, okay? So you'll forgive me if I cheat you out of the other half of the argument. But this is the, the kind of argument they have to give. Now, I, I could be better. I could say I an element of I, J an element of J, and cross my I's and dot my J's and, you know, everything in here. But I, I hope this level of, um, I hope this is sufficiently pedantic that you can follow it, okay? Um, and I try to give you the same freedom, but don't be too fuzzy, otherwise I won't believe that you know what you're doing. Um, so remember your goal in homework and tests is to convince your professor that you know what you're doing, right? And also to learn. Yeah, how about that? That's more important. Um, pro properties of inverse, properties of images and inverse images. All right, so, um, it's kind of, you know, which, which of these is not like the other? Which one of these does not belong? Um, there's just one here, this pesky subset right here, right? The, um, image of a union is the union of the images. The inverse image of a union is the union of the inverse images. The inverse image of an intersection 
is the intersection of the inverse images. All these guys equal equals equals equals. But this one right here, f of an intersection, is a subset of the intersections. All right. So, um, and I should mention you can replace unions and intersections over a and b to the same relation over families of index sets. Right. So. Um, I've written it for two things, but you could generalize it to unions over, over index or in, in intersections over index sets with the appropriate main, main, uh, maintaining of equality here, here, and here, and subset there. Now, this right here is what uh, Minetti calls the projection formula. It says f of a intersect the inverse image of b, it's equal to f of a intersect b, which is, you know, kind of an interesting formula. So... Let's see. I think I, I forget if I prove it or not. I might prove it. Let's see. If I did, I've done a homework problem in Minetti, which I did not assign, so don't worry. <laughs> I haven't deprived you of any joy. So, let's see here. So, proof. I think what I'm working on here is the first one that, that I'm, I'm working to prove this here, right here. All right, so let's, let me, let's look at my proof. All right, so let X be in the image of the union then that means that there exists a y in A, and a union B uh, for which f of y equals to x. All right. Now, y is in the union. That means y is in A or y is in B. Therefore, x is in f of A or x is in f of B. But that's all we need to know that x is in f of A union f of B. Therefore, f of A union B is a subset of f of A union f of B. Now, on the other hand, if we let z be an element of the, inter of the union of the images, then that means that z is in f of a, or z is in f of b. Now, okay, so if z is in f of a, then there exists a w and a such that f of w equals to z, which means that w is an element of a union b, and f of z, of course, f of w is still equal to z, but that is all you need to see that z is an element of f of a union b. And likewise, if z is an f of b, that means that z is an element of f of a union b, and we can conclude that f of a union f of b is a subset of f of a union b. And then by double containment, we have equality of these sets. All right. And, and the, other, the other properties up here can be proved by similar claims, and, and hopefully you'll do that. At least one of those, I think, is in your homework, right? Um, now, I think if I remember right, this can become equality if what? I think it's sufficient for F to be an injection, but you should check me on that. Let's see here. Oh, what is an injection? Well, we'll talk about that soon enough. Um, hopefully you've seen injective and surjective in a previous course, but we will we'll talk about them more. Not so much in this lecture, but in the next, I think. Okay, so claim, this is the projection formula from Minetti. F of A intersect F inverse of B, that's a subset of F of A intersect B. Now, I've, I've decided to just prove half of the uh, projection formula, all right? So here's the proof. Um, let X be an element of that, right? Then that means that there exists a Y in A intersect F intersect F inverse B for which f of y equals to x. All right, what does that mean? That means that y is an element of a, and y is an element of the inverse image of b. So what's that mean? That means that there exists a b in b, such that f of y is equal to b, right? Put it all together. Well, we've got f of y, right, equals to b, but b is equal, but f of y is also equal to x, so we've got b equals to x, but that shows that x is an element of b, right? Um, and we also know that x is an element of f, f, f of a. Um, where was that? I've lost track of my work. Um, x is an element of f of a. That's from here. Y, so x equals f of y, right? Um, and y is an element of a. That means that x is an element of f of a because 
y is an a, right? And it maps to x. That means that x is an f of a. Okay, so x is in um, b, and x is in f of a, which means that x is in the intersection of f of a and b. So I do think this one's a little bit harder than the previous one. You have to kind of think a little bit more about this one. But Now I should warn, when I talk about f inverse here, don't think inverse function. It's not. It's generally a relation, right? And the, f, the inverse image of a point is it's not just a point. It could be a whole set of things. Right? If an f inverse of a set is a set of points in the domain which map to that set, right? So I just thought I'd play around with this projection formula for a minute while I got it out in front of me. So I said, okay, well, what happens if I put a to be the domain of f, right? Then the inverse image of b intersect the domain of f. Well, that's just going to be the inverse image of b, right? Because uh, the inverse image has to be um, has to be a subset of the domain. Um, well, yeah, it could be that the inverse image of B is empty, right? But fine, it'd still be empty set equals empty set formula. Anyway, so the projection formula reduces to, um, so if, so what I'm saying is this right here, I, I put A equal to the domain of F. So then domain of F union that is just that again. It's just F inverse of B again, so we get F of F inverse of B is equal to F of the domain of F intersect B. So, that's, I don't know, whatever. And um, if B is a subset of the range, right, F of the domain of F, then we get F of the F inverse image of B is equal to B again. So that's reminiscent of pre-calculus, right, where we have F inverse, F of F inverse of X is equal to X again for like the point but now we're talking about a set, okay? And I don't believe that this has to be, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not insisting here that um, f inverse be a function, right? This is a, a, a comment about sets, all right? Okay, anyway, if I was teaching a proofs course, I would probably drill down into that more. Um, anyway, so um, definition, in case you forgot, f is injective or one to one and we write this or we write that if f is surjective or onto then we write f like double arrow like that or f like that so these are these are shorthands for injective and surjective or one to one and onto going forward if you see that used in the book you know what it is right um, so i should say this if f from x to y is injective then f inverse from the image of f under x to x is in fact a function. Okay, so more more on that, and I will define one-to-one -one and onto either on the next page, oh no, I do it in the next lecture, so you'll have to wait. Sorry about that. So one last thing about um, set theory here, and this is kind of a, well it's a good source of, of less familiar examples, and it's fun to work with. Cartesian product of sets, um, use a pi i equals 1 to n of xi is x1 cross to that cross xn. This is a set of n tuples where each component is in xi for i equal 1 to n. It's the set of ordered n tuples, and the key property of an n tuple is that two n tuples are equal if and only if each one of the components matches up, okay? So here's a, here's a claim. Um, maybe kind of like your homework, but I think your homework might be slightly easier even, I don't know, but, um, all right, so here we go, here we go. Claim, A intersect B Cartesian product with C intersect D is A Cartesian product C intersect B Cartesian product D. Okay, let's work through it. Let X be an element of the left-hand side, right? then that means that there exists x1 in A intersect B and x2 in C intersect D, for which x is equal to the pair x1 comma x2. All right, that's just the definition of the Cartesian product. But if x is in A intersect B, that means x is x1 is in A and x1 is also in B. And if x2 is in C intersect D, that means x2 is in C and x2 is in D. Hence, x1 comma x2, 
right, is an element of a cross c because x1 is in a and x2 is in c, right? x1 is in a and x2 is in c. And also x is equal to x1 comma x2 is an element of b cross d because x1 is in b and x2 is in d, right? So it's in here and it's in here, therefore it's in the intersection. So that shows that um, this is a subset of that. And, oh, again, I'm cheating you out of the other half of the proof, so I, 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 should, I should be, uh, you know, proof and ever, truth and advertising here. Let me fix it. This is proof divided by two. There we go. It's only half of the proof. So, um, anyway, stupid dad jokes aside, what do we got here? Oh, this is weird. I, you know, I don't, I don't remember if Minetti ever comes back to this later. But I, I don't know if I've seen this anywhere else. It's, it's interesting. He's like, A is a subset of X cross Y, and um, B is non-empty, a subset of Y. Then the quotient, A by B, of X is defined by A by B is X and X, such that um, the, set, the singleton containing X Cartesian product with B is a subset of A. So his, his example of it is, okay, so like X Cartesian product Y by Y is X again. Um, and, and I played with this for a little bit, and, and uh, I have no intuition for it at all. It's it's just a quirky little thing. I mean, I I don't know. Um, I don't know what to say about that. It's interesting. But. All right, well, that's it for sets. I will move on next time to lecture, where are we on? Three? Yeah, so lecture three is on... How to build a bijection. So we'll get into that next. Thanks, guys.